Section 25 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 1854-1859 by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. P. Paul Children's Prattle At a rich merchant's house there was a children's party, and the children of rich and great people were there. The merchant was a learned man, for his father had sent him to college, and he had passed his examination. His father had been at first only a cattle dealer, but always honest and industrious, so that he had made money, and his son, the merchant, had managed to increase his store. Clever as he was, he had also a heart, but there was less said of his heart than of his money. All descriptions of people visited at the merchant's house, well-born as well as intellectual, and some who possessed neither of these recommendations. Now it was a children's party, and there was children's prattle, which always is spoken freely from the heart. Among them was a beautiful little girl who was terribly proud. But this had been taught to her by the servants, and not by her parents, who were far too sensible people. Her father was groom of the chambers, which is a high office at court, and she knew it. "'I am a child of the court,' she said. Now she might just as well have been a child of the cellar, for no one can help his birth. And then she told the other children that she was well born, and said that no one who was not well born could rise in the world. It was no use to read and be industrious, for if a person was not well born, he could never achieve anything. And those whose names end in sen can never be anything at all, said she. We must put our arms akimbo and make the elbow quite pointed so as to keep these sen people at a great distance. And then she stuck out her pretty little arms and made the elbows quite pointed to show how it was to be done. And her arms were very pretty, for she was a sweet-looking child. But the little daughter of the merchant became very angry at this speech, for her father's name was Peterson, and she knew that the name ended in Sen. And therefore she said as proudly as she could, But my papa can buy a hundred dollars' worth of bonbons and give them away to children. Can your papa do that? Yes, and my papa, said the little daughter of the editor of a paper, my papa can put your papa and everybody's papa into the newspaper. All sorts of people are afraid of him, my mamma says, for he can do as he likes with the paper. And the little maiden looked exceedingly proud, as if she had been a real princess who may be expected to look proud. But outside the door, which stood ajar, was a poor boy, peeping through the crack of the door. He was of such a lowly station that he had not been allowed even to enter the room. He had been turning the spit for the cook and she had given him permission to stand behind the door and peep in at the well-dressed children, who were having such a merry time within. And for him that was a great deal. Oh, if I could be one of them, thought he. And then he heard what was said about names, which was quite enough to make him more unhappy. His parents at home had not even a penny to spare to buy a newspaper, much less could they write in one. And worse than all, his father's name, and of course his own, ended in sen, and therefore he could never turn out well, which was a very sad thought. But after all, he had been born into the world, and the station of life had been chosen for him. Therefore he must be content. And this is what happened on that evening. Many years passed, and most of the children became grown-up persons. There stood a splendid house in the town, filled with all kinds of beautiful and valuable objects. Everybody wished to see it, and people even came in from the country round to be permitted to view the treasures it contained. Which of the children whose prattle we have described could call this house his own? One would suppose it very easy to guess. No, no, it is not so very easy. The house belonged to the poor little boy who had stood on that night behind the door. He had really become something great, although his name ended in Sen for it was Thorwaldsen, and the three other children, the children of good birth, of money, and of intellectual pride. Well, they were respected and honored in the world, for they had been well provided for by birth and position, 
and they had no cause to reproach themselves with what they had thought and spoken on that evening long ago. For after all, it was mere children's prattle. End of Children's Prattle Section 26 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859 by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Child in the Grave It was a very sad day, and every heart in the house felt the deepest grief. For the youngest child, a boy of four years old, the joy and hope of his parents, was dead. Two daughters, the elder of whom was going to be confirmed, still remained. They were both good, charming girls, but the lost child always seemed the dearest. And when it is the youngest, and a son, it makes the trial still more heavy. The sisters mourned as young hearts can mourn, and were especially grieved at the sight of their parents' sorrow. The father's heart was bowed down, but the mother's sunk completely under the deep grief. Day and night she had attended to the sick child, nursing and carrying it in her bosom, as a part of herself. She could not realize the fact that the child was dead, and must be laid in a coffin to rest in the ground. She thought God would not take her darling little one from her, and when it did happen, notwithstanding her hopes and her belief, and there could be no more doubt on the subject, she said in her feverish agony, God does not know it. He has hard-hearted ministering spirits on earth, who do according to their own will, and heed not a mother's prayers. Thus, in her great grief, she fell away from her faith in God, and dark thoughts arose in her mind. Respecting death and a future state, she tried to believe that man was but dust, and that with his life all existence ended. But these doubts were no support to her, nothing on which she could rest, and she sunk into the fathomless depth of despair. In her darkest hours she ceased to weep and thought not of the young daughters who were still left to her. The tears of her husband fell on her forehead, but she took no notice of him. Her thoughts were with her dead child. Her whole existence seemed wrapped up in the remembrance of the little one and of every innocent word it had uttered. The day of the little child's funeral came. For nights previously the mother had not slept, but in the morning twilight of this day she sunk from weariness into a deep sleep. In the meantime the coffin was carried into a distant room, and there nailed down, that she might not hear the blows of the hammer. When she awoke, and wanted to see her child, the husband, with tears, said, We have closed the coffin. It was necessary to do so. When God is so hard to me, how can I expect men to be better? She said with groans and tears. The coffin was carried to the grave, and the disconsolate mother sat with her young daughters. She looked at them, but she saw them not, for her thoughts were far away from the domestic hearth. She gave herself up to her grief, and it tossed her to and fro, as the sea tosses a ship without compass or rudder. So the day of the funeral passed away, and similar days followed, of dark, wearisome pain. With tearful eyes and mournful glances, the sorrowing daughters and the afflicted husband looked upon her who would not hear their words of comfort, and, indeed, what comforting words could they speak, when they were themselves so full of grief? It seemed as if she would never again know sleep, and yet it would have been her best friend, one who would have strengthened her body and poured peace into her soul. They at last persuaded her to lie down, and then she would lie as still as if she slept. 
One night, when her husband listened, as he often did, to her breathing, he quite believed that she had at length found rest and relief in sleep. He folded his arms and prayed, and soon sunk himself into healthful sleep. Therefore he did not notice that his wife arose, threw on her clothes, and glided silently from the house, to go where her thoughts constantly lingered, to the grave of her child. She passed through the garden, to a path across a field that led to the churchyard. No one saw her as she walked, nor did she see anyone, for her eyes were fixed upon the one object of her wanderings. It was a lovely starlight night in the beginning of September, and the air was mild and still. She entered the churchyard, and stood by the little grave, which looked like a large nosegay of fragrant flowers. She sat down and bent her head low over the grave, as if she could see her child through the earth that covered him. Her little boy, whose smile was so vivid before her, and the gentle expression of whose eyes, even on his sickbed, she could not forget. How full of meaning that glance had been, as she leaned over him, holding in hers the pale hand which she had no longer strength to raise. As she had sat by his little cot, so now she sat by his grave, and there she could weep freely, and her tears fell upon it. "'Thou wouldst gladly go down and be with thy child,' said a voice quite close to her, a voice that sounded so deep and clear that it went to her heart. She looked up, and by her side stood a man wrapped in a black cloak, with a hood closely drawn over his face, but her keen glance could distinguish the face under the hood. It was stern, yet awakened confidence, and the eyes beamed with youthful radiance. "'Down to my child,' she repeated, and tones of despair and entreaty sounded in the words. "'Darest thou to follow me?' asked the form. "'I am death.' She bowed her head in token of assent. Then suddenly it appeared, as if all the stars were shining with the radiance of the full moon on the many-coloured flowers that decked a grave. The earth that covered it was drawn back like a floating drapery. She sunk down, and the spectre covered her with a black cloak. Night closed around her, the night of death. She sank deeper than the spade of the sexton could penetrate, till a churchyard became a roof above her. Then the cloak was removed, and she found herself in a large hall, of a wide-spreading dimensions, in which there was a subdued light, like twilight, reigning, and in a moment her child appeared before her, smiling and more beautiful than ever. With a silent cry she pressed him to her heart. A glorious strain of music sounded, now distant, now clear. Never had she listened to such tones as these. They came from beyond a large, dark curtain, which separated the regions of death from the land of eternity. "'My sweet, darling mother,' she heard a child say. It was the well-known, beloved voice, and kiss followed kiss, in boundless delight. Then the child pointed to the dark curtain. "'There is nothing so beautiful on earth as it is here. Mother, do you not see them all? Oh, it is happiness indeed!' But the mother saw nothing of what the child pointed out, only the dark curtain. She looked with earthly eyes, and could not see as the child saw, he whom God has called to be with himself. She could hear the sounds of music, but she heard not the words, the word in which she was to trust. "'I can fly now, mother,' said the child. "'I can fly with other happy children in the presence of the Almighty. I would fain fly away now, but if you weep for me as you were weeping now, you may never see me again, and yet I would go so gladly. May I not fly away? And you will come to me soon, will you not, dear mother? Oh, stay, stay, implored the mother. Only one moment more, only once more, that I may look upon thee, and kiss thee, and press thee to my heart. Then she kissed and fondled her child. Suddenly her name was called from above. What could it mean? Her name uttered in a plaintive voice. "'Hearest thou?' said the child. "'It is my father who calls thee.' 
and in a few moments deep sighs were heard, as if children weeping. "'They are my sisters,' said the child. "'Mother, surely you have not forgotten them.' And then she remembered those she left behind, and a great terror came over her. She looked around her at the dark night. Dim forms flitted by. She seemed to recognize some of them, as they floated through the regions of death towards the dark curtain, where they vanished. Would her husband and her daughters flit past? No, their sighs and lamentations still sounded from above, and she had nearly forgotten them for the sake of him who was dead. Mother, now the bells of heaven are ringing, said the child. Mother, the sun is going to rise. An overpowering light streamed in upon her. The child had vanished, and she was being borne upwards. All around her became cold. She lifted her head, and saw that she was lying in the churchyard on the grave of her child. The Lord, in a dream, had been a guide to her feet and a light to her spirit. She bowed her knees and prayed for forgiveness. She had wished to keep back a soul from its immortal flight. She had forgotten her duties towards the living who were left her. And when she had offered this prayer, her heart felt lighter. The sun burst forth, over her head a little bird carolled his song, and the church bells sounded for the early service. Everything around her seemed holy, and her heart was chastened. She acknowledged the goodness of God, she acknowledged the duties she had to perform, and eagerly she returned home. She bent over her husband, who still slept. Her warm, devoted kiss awakened him, and words of heartfelt love fell from the lips of both. Now she was gentle and strong as a wife can be, and from her lips came the words of faith, Whatever he doth is right and best. Then her husband asked, From whence hast thou all at once derived such strength and comforting faith? And as she kissed him and her children, she said, It came from God, through my child in the grave. End of The Child in the Grave Section 27 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen Larberg. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854 to 1859, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Two Brothers by Hans Christian Andersen, 1859. On one of the Danish islands, where old thing stones, the seats of justice of our forefathers, still stand in the cornfields, and huge trees rise in the forests of beech, there lies a little town whose low houses are covered with red tiles. In one of these houses strange things were brewing over the glowing coals on the open hearth, there was a boiling going on in glasses and a mixing and distilling, while herbs were being cut up and pounded in mortars. An elderly man looked after it all. One must only do the right thing, he said. Yes, the right, the correct thing. One must find out the truth concerning every created particle and keep to that. In the room with the good housewife sat her two sons, they were still small, but had great thoughts. Their mother, too, had always spoken to them of right and justice, and exhorted them to keep to the truth, which she said was the countenance of the Lord in this world. The elder of the boys looked roguish and enterprising. He took a delight in reading of the forces of nature, of the sun and the moon. No fairy tale pleased him so much. Oh, how beautiful it must be, he thought, to go on voyages of discovery or to find out how to imitate the wings of birds and then to be able to fly. Yes, to find that out was the right thing. Father was right and mother was right. Truth holds the world together. The younger brother was quieter and buried himself entirely in his books. 
When he read about Jacob dressing himself in sheepskins to personify Esau and so to usurp his brother's birthright, he would clench his little fist in anger against the deceiver. When he read of tyrants and of the injustice and wickedness of the world, tears would come into his eyes, and he was quite filled with the thought of the justice and truth which must and would triumph. One evening he was lying in bed, but the curtains were not yet drawn close, and the light streamed in upon him. He had taken his book into bed with him, for he wanted to finish reading the story of Solon. His thoughts lifted and carried him away a wonderful distance. It seemed to him as if the bed had become a ship flying along under full sail. Was he dreaming, or what was happening? It glided over the rolling waves and across the ocean of time, and to him came the voice of Solon, spoken in a strange tongue, yet intelligible to him. He heard the Danish motto, By law the land is ruled. The genius of the human race stood in the humble room, bent down over the bed, and imprinted a kiss on the boy's forehead. Be thou strong in fame and strong in the battle of life. With truth in thy heart fly toward the land of truth. The elder brother was not yet in bed. He was standing at the window looking out at the mist which rose from the meadows. There were not elves dancing out there, as their old nurse had told him. He knew better. There were vapors which were warmer than the air, and that is why they rose. A shooting star lit up the sky, and the boy's thoughts passed in a second from the vapors of the earth up to the shining meteor. The stars gleamed in the heavens, and it seemed as if long golden threads hung down from them to the earth. Fly with me, sang a voice which the boy heard in his heart, and the mighty genius of mankind, swifter than a bird and than an arrow, swifter than anything of earthly origin, carried him out into space where the heavenly bodies are bound together by the rays that pass from star to star. Our earth revolved in the thin air, and the cities upon it seemed to lie close to each other. Through the spheres echoed the words, What is near, what is far, when thou art lifted by the mighty genius of mind? And again the boy stood by the window, gazing out, whilst his younger brother lay in bed. Their mother called them by their names, Anders Sando and Hans Christian. Denmark and the whole world knows them, the two brothers Orsted. End of Two Brothers Recording by Kathleen Larberg End of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 4, 1854-1859, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H.P. Paul.